And welcome into the live casino and hotel studios in Baltimore. I'm Gary Stein, riding shotgun Griffin Bass. How are you, my friend? I'm good, Gary. Thank you. How are you? Two straight weeks. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty fun. I like it. Who's Who's Glenn Clark? I forgot already. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're going to welcome back Glenn Clark next week, so don't you worry about it. The one and only will be back. PLL Weekly is on the air. Week six, or I should say week eight in the PLL. And here is what you get. Three big games in Denver as the season's second half opens and teams jockey for playoff positions. We'll have to talk about that. We'll have the standings and stat leaders for you as well. And we'll meet two of the league's stars this afternoon. One goes by the name The Milkman, and the other has the distinction he was the first player ever traded in league history. We'll tell you more about that. But we begin at Dick Sporting Goods Park in Denver, Colorado, site of this past weekend's PLL action. It was week number eight kicking off the weekend's action the atlas and the redwoods on a fr- on a saturday uh, afternoon 18 15 the final uh, connor busek had a first period hat trick for the atlas as they jumped out to a five goal lead led by eight at the half it really wasn't a game after that the redwoods would come back led by jules henningberg with a pair of goals in the second half but the atlas had the advantage and atlas beats redwoods 18 15 atlas now three and four as they inject themselves back into the playoff picture, and the Redwoods uh, a fall to 4-3 and three on the season. In game uh, two of Saturday night, a rematch of the top two clubs in the league, the Chaos avenged their week one overtime loss to the Whip Snakes. The Chaos beat the Whip Snakes 13-12 was the final. Both teams are now tied for first in the PLL at 5-2. and two. Deemer Class with a hat trick for the Chaos, including the game winner with about two minutes left to play. The Chaos played without a couple of key attackmen in the game, Miles Thompson and Josh Byrne. No problem, Mike Bocklet and Kevin Buchanan took over. Buchanan had two goals early on for the Chaos. Whipstakes led by Ryan Drenner uh, with four goals in the game. Blaze reared and sealed it, by the way, with a sprawling save with about two, bin, uh, two minutes to play, and that was save number 17 for Reardon. The Chaos beat the Whips 13-12, both teams now tied for first place in the league at 5-2. and two. And then in the final game on Sunday, the Archers and the Chrome. Archers on top of the Chrome, 9-7. Chrome now fall to 1-6. and six. Archers are back in the playoff hunt at 3-4. and four. They broke a three-game slide. Uh, I should say a four-game slide. Uh, they were 3-0, and oh, then lost uh, a four in a row. And now they're 3-4. and four. Dom Starge's team goal differential now is zero. That's the Chrome. Believe it. They're 1-6, and six, and they've scored just as many goals as they've given up. Marcus Holman had a pair of two two-point goals in the game. Tom Schreiber had two goals, one in each half, and we'll have a Crone sensation Connor the Milkman Farrell with us in just a couple of minutes. Uh, let's get to the standings real quick. The Whips and the Chaos are tied at 5-2. and two. The Redwoods at 4-3. and three. The Archers are in fourth right now at 3-4, and four, along with the Atlas at 3-4. and four. The Chrome 1-6, and six. but again, their goal differential is zero on the season through seven games. In fact, four of the six teams, the Chaos, the Redwoods, the Archers, and the Chrome, all have zero goal differentials, meaning they've scored as many as they've let up so far through seven weeks. League leaders in points, Matt Rambo leads it for the Whips with 30. Henningberg and Justin Gutterding of the Chrome with 26, along with Tom Schreiber of the Archers and Marcus Holman of the Archers with 25. Goals, Henningberg leads. We'll talk to him in a few minutes. 18 goals along with Connor Fields from the Chaos, 16 for Marcus Holman, and 16 for Ryan Drenner. The assists, Matt Rambo of the Whips, 17 on the season. Schreiber with 14, Gutterding with 11. Face-off percentage, and there are some excellent face-off men in this league. Trevor Baptiste, of course, with the uh, with the Atlas, 66.7. Right now leads the league. Joe Nardella with the Whips at 57. Connor Farrell of the Chrome at 55. He is third in the league. Cost turnovers, Garrett Eppel still up top, 18 for the Redwoods, 2.6 per game. Save percentage, Drew Adams of the Archers coming on now, 63%. Brett Queener of the Chrome at 60 0.7%. And ground balls, Joe Nardella of the Whips leads it with 56. Tom Kelly of the uh, Chaos and Stephen Kelly of the Archers, 50, 45. Baptiste with 45. And Connor Farrell with 43 for the Chrome. And that will do it for our stats wrap up and our standings. Do we have our guest? We absolutely do. As we welcome in the milkman, uh, Connor Farrell from the Chrome. Uh, Connor, welcome in, my friend. How are you? How's it going? Thanks for having me. Hey, we're excellent, and uh, so far seven excellent weeks of action. Uh, we're going to get into a lot of stuff with you, but just tell us overall how you're feeling right now and what about the first seven weeks of this league. I'm feeling good right now. We, uh, Even though our record's 1-6, we're still in the hunt. 
and we still have uh, three regular season games left. And we're, we're working hard. We're getting ready for the next week in uh, San Jose, even though we have a week off. We're in San Jose, San Jose the following week, so we're ready to work. Get ready. Absolutely. And so, you know, that's something interesting, uh, Connor. It's not lost on you guys that your goal differential is zero, uh, being one and six. In fact, four teams in the league are zero, which just speaks to the to the tightness of these games. 16 of the 22 games so far, including the All-Star game, have been decided by one goal or less. And, I mean, I mean the level of the competition here, the, the tightness of the league, that's, that's really got to be something to behold. Yeah, it's pretty incredible how well they made the teams up, how each game either goes in overtime or it's a one-goal game. It's pretty crazy. All right, so let's talk about your story because you're becoming like one of the, you know, neat stories, one of the faces of the league. I'm sure, you know, many of the people who listen or watch this podcast on Facebook Live have, have seen your stuff with R.J. Kaminsky on uh, on Instagram, on Twitter. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got the long blonde hair. You've got the nickname, the milkman. <laughs> Some people call you Thor. Just, just give us a little background on you and what your story is and how you got to this point right now. Yeah, of course. So, um, Grew up on Long Island, from on Long Island, from New York. Uh, went to college at a small D two school called LAU Post. Now it's LAU. They're going on to D one now. Now that I'm gone, but uh, <laughs> came into this league. Well, I went went to college for football originally, and I lost a bet to my buddy, and I ended up playing lacrosse uh, at the very end of my freshman year during that season. I joined very late because I lost that bet, and um, came here. Didn't really focused that much on lacrosse until my junior year of college because I wasn't really that good until then. And I had a good coach. He's actually in the PLL. Tommy Kelly was my coach those last two years. Sure. And um, now I'm here. So, uh, like, how much – okay, so if you went to college for football, how much lacrosse did you actually play growing up? I played all throughout high school and all that when I was younger too, but I really wasn't focused on that. I was more of a football guy. You know, I'm bigger, so I was always the guy that I wanted to – hit the running back and all that, but I didn't really focus more on lacrosse until college, like junior year of college two years ago. Right. Well, you certainly bring that linebacker mentality to, uh, yeah. <laughs> to, to the field. There's no doubt about it. Um, what kind of bet did you actually lose? So my the team really needed a face this guy because their guy wasn't do, doing that well, and they were heading into the conference uh, tournament. And uh, my buddy made it better than me. He said that if you join the lacrosse team, if I last longer than 10 seconds with a wrestling match, you had to join the lacrosse team. And he ended up less than 12 seconds before I pinned him, and then I was on the team on the team the next day at practice. Well, and you kind of took the team by storm. I mean, I was looking up some of your stats, and when you first started, I think you were at about 65% at the face-off yeah. X. Then it went up to 74% in your junior year. Last mm-hmm. year... You were in the record books as far as D2 for multiple single-game records. I think you won 34 face-offs in one game alone, uh, yeah. and, your, and your percentage was eight, 844, if I'm not mistaken. What is that it, right. Right. What is it all about for you at the X? How do you approach it? I walk into every face-off thinking I'm the best there is. I don't care where I come from. I walk in there thinking I'm the best because facing-off is a lot mental. You, you go in there thinking you're going to win and thinking you're the best, you got to come out with the ball. So you think you're better than Trevor Baptiste? <laughs> he's very good. <laughs> he's actually, he's definitely good. But I go into every face-off thinking I'm the best. No, he's no, very I, good, though. Yeah, no, I'm just to- I'm to- I'm totally you know I mean? I'm right. I'm totally messing with you. But so, <laughs> but I tell you what, it it does bring up an interesting point, though. Tre- Trevor Baptiste is obviously. my team went to Sacred Heart. We were, we were both talking how I didn't score a goal yet. And I said, first face was going to win it, go down and score right away. And so after the, right after the play, we were laughing because I literally called it the night before. It was hmm. funny. You were drafted by the Lizards of the MLL. What turned you over to the PLL? Uh, Coach Darsha, he's, he's the man. I love him. The way he was talking to me, he, he, looked, he sounded very into it. He's a great coach. I couldn't wait to play for him, had the opportunity to play for him. 
And we're talking with Connor Farrell, a.k.a. the Milkman, face-off specialist uh, for the Chrome. The Chrome beaten by the Archers 9-7 was the final. Today's show is brought to you by Mobile Synthetic Oil. It keeps your engine running like new. Synthetic motor oils, trusted protection, the mobile advantage. I mentioned, uh, Connor, that anybody that has seen your uh, your videos, your posts, uh, knows what you look like. You've got the long, flowing blonde hair. Let's Let's talk about that. When did you start to grow your hair long, and what do you like about it? So I started growing it out my uh, senior season of uh, of my high school career. I wanted to be like Clay Matthews in college with the long blonde hair and football. Right. Yep. Because I thought it looked really cool, so that's why I started growing it out. Yet at the same time, Connor, you, you've you called yourself, like this is your quote, okay? I'm not, It's not my quote. You've said, hey, at heart, I'm a mama's boy. So yep. you you like you like 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 you like to be at home like you like to be close to home. So what yep. does she what do, what does she think about your hair? She actually likes it. She, <laughs> she likes it. When I was younger, I used to have a buzz cut all around. I used to get a one all the way around my head. So I was like, a, I had very short hair. Right. So it's a big difference. So she loves it now. Talking with Connor Farrell from the Chrome, we've got just a couple more minutes. So you're here. Here's where we are. Week eight coming up. Like you say, you guys have a bye. Everybody's got a bye this week. And then on to San Jose, the week of the 10th and the 11th. You know, from LIU Post, from a small D2 school, you started out as a football player. You then moved on to lacrosse. Now you're in the PLL. The PLL is getting some great headlines everywhere they go every week. Like, can you believe this is happening? Get, get me inside your head a little bit as to what's happened to you over the last couple months. Uh, it's really crazy what the uh, social media people all did from the PLL. They really blew up my picture. I love I love what they're doing. They yeah. have, they're a great team. Everyone there at the PLL, they're nice. They're awesome. They work hard. They're the best workers I've ever seen. They they do a really good job. But I'm having a great time here. I'm having the time of my life. I love it. Why, why do you drink so much milk, and when did you start to drink it? I've been drinking a lot of milk since when I was young. Me and my brother, we would have seven gallons of milk a week. We would drink so We just loved it all the time. Wait, wait, wait. Seven gallons... Each or together? Each. Each. Wait, so is it whole milk? Is it 2%? What, what is it? Uh, it'd be either or, two, usually 2%. Wow. You drank seven, so basically you drank a gallon of milk a day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I got to tell you something. I've, I've never heard anybody say that. That's a lot of milk. <laughs> uh, you know what? I, I know your social media team does a great job. Is absolutely true. They got to do a specific story on that. Like, they got to watch you drink a whole gallon of milk. Oh, my God. That is unbelievable. Hey, listen, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you. We really no love problem. watching you play. And uh, keep up the thank good you. work and keep up the hair and the milk and just <laughs> just, just keep doing everything. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, my man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, he is one of the great stories and one of the faces of the league. Connor Farrell, if you have not uh, heard, of, uh, heard of him or seen him play or – or heard of his um, uh, acumen, he is one of the great face-off guys in the league. And um, right now at 55%, I think he's third uh, behind. No, he's behind Trevor Baptiste. There may be another guy in front of him, but he's uh, his nickname, Connor the Milkman Farrell, and you heard him, seven gallons of milk a week. He's been drinking it since he was a kid. It's basically a gallon a day, him and his brother. I don't even know how his parents afforded all that milk, to be honest with you. I mean, think about it for a minute, okay? I don't know where you live, where you're watching, or where you're listening, but let's just say a gallon of milk costs three bucks a, a, a gallon. All right, let's just call it, you know, median cost. That's $21 a week per child. That's $42 a week in milk. $42 a week milk bill for the ferals. And that's just milk. That's not, you know, <laughs> that's not anything else. He hadn't eaten anything. It cost Mama and Papa Farrell $42 before either one of those kids had eaten anything, and that's just milk. So anyway, congratulations to Connor Farrell. He's really lighting it up, uh, doing a great job for the Chrome. Uh, and like we said, I mean, the Chrome, you know, they're one in six. They had a five-game losing streak to start the season. They won a couple of weeks back before the All-Star game, and then they won or they, they lost the other day. Their goal differential is zero uh, at this point, and that uh, means that they've given up as many as they put in, and uh, it just goes to show how close this uh, th- this uh, league has been. There's no doubt about it. So we're hoping to make yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I just called him. He didn't pick up. Uh, was, I think it's uh, we called him a little bit earlier than uh, we said we would. So maybe I'll give him another minute or two, and then okay. I'll try again. Yep, uh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So our next guest, and we hope to have him, is Jules Henningberg, the attackman for the Redwoods. Uh, Jules played at Rutgers. He's from Maplewood, New Jersey, 
and um, he holds the distinction, and we'll talk to him about it. He was the first player ever uh, to be traded uh, in the uh, in in the league, uh, coming over to the Redwoods. And I remember I was at Homewood Field in Baltimore uh, when we um, when the trade was made, and he played his first game for the Redwoods, and he had five goals and three assists, many of them acrobatic, eight point game for him, and. Um, uh, that was quite a trade, and I think the Redwoods really uh, made out on that, and we'll talk with Jules Hennenberg in just a few minutes. Uh, two-time All-Big Ten player at Rutgers, uh, two-time first-team All-American, uh, first player traded in PLL history. He's got 26 points, second in the PLL right now, and he's tied for first in goals with 18, Connor Fields from the Chaos. And, of course, in his debut, it was an eight-point day as the Redwoods beat the Chrome 13-11 after the Chrome had traded him. Uh, while we have a minute before we get to uh, Jules Hennenberg, let's tell you a little bit about what's coming up for the PLL. Uh, they are on the bye this week, uh, so they'll be off. It's a little weird, actually, because they had the bye right before the All-Star game, and they got another bye after the week after the All-Star game. And then they're back in action in San Jose on August 10th. That's two games on Saturday, one on Sunday. The uh, game on the 10th is at 4 p.m. That'll be the Redwoods and the Chaos. And then the game on the 7th, these are all Eastern times, by the way. Uh, game on the 10th at 7 p.m., it'll be the Chrome and the Whip Snakes. And then they turn it over to Sunday the 11th, 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. It'll be the Archers and the Atlas. And again, that'll be in San Jose. After San Jose, there are uh, two consecutive weeks of action. The weekend of the 17th and the 18th, the uh, league, the PLL, is in Hamilton, uh, Ontario. That'll be their first foray outside the United States. And then the week of the 24th and 25th of August, they'll be up in Albany, New York. And, of course, everybody that's uh, following college lacrosse knows what Albany has done the last few years with the Thompson triplets and Blaze Reardon in goal and just a host of other great players. They have really moved up the ranks in the college game, and Albany certainly is a great uh, city uh, for college lacrosse and the PLL, hoping that they can replicate that with the pro game coming to Albany the week of the 24th and the 25th. Uh, the following weekend is the weekend of Labor Day, and the league is off. And then after that, September 6th and 7th, uh, the PLL goes to Columbus, Ohio. Then the week of the 14th, they'll be back in New York for, uh, I guess, a, a redux. So they were in New York the first, uh, actually the second week, back the 8th and the 9th. And then the uh, championship weekend will be the weekend of the 21st of September. That'll be in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, he, he needs just like two or three more minutes, and then he'll be able to talk with us. No problem. So we'll, right. we'll check in with Jules Hennenberg in just a moment. Let's get back to the standings real quick. And uh, just tell, tell you a little bit about how the league is shaping up. You know, everybody really still has a realistic shot at uh, one through four, except, you know, I mean, look, even the Chrome, even the Chrome at one and six were through seven games. Uh, the, there are still five more left to go. Uh, that's not impossible. I mean, yeah. the Whips and the Chaos are at five and two. They're tied for first. The Redwoods are four and three. The Archers and the Atlas are three and four. So they're only two games ahead of the Chrome. Not impossible to make up. Yeah, yeah, because they just need a few good games. It's just three, three good games, and uh, because the Archers or the Atlas have a very bad goal differential, so they could easily overpass them if they went three in a row. And and the Atlas have a few bad weeks, so nothing's impossible. You know, and it's funny yeah. you say that because you look at their goal differential; it's minus nine, right? Okay, which is the right. worst in the league, <laughs> but it's seven games. Yeah. So on average, it's just over one goal, one yeah, point per game. Exactly. And uh, <laughs> just goes to show you how. How, how tight everything is. Uh, but if Connor Farrell has anything to say about it, the Chrome, uh, even at 1-6, and six, they're still looking up, and uh, you know it's going to be a fight to the finish, which is actually an interesting way to put it because the play, and I was talking to Josh Sims about this a couple of weeks ago, the, the, I mean, the play's been controlled. There's no doubt about it, but it's been a little chippy. And, um, you know, I think, again, they've maintained control. There's no doubt. But uh, as the season winds down and as the playoffs come near and as – the teams are really getting, you know, set and ready to go for the playoff push. I think you'll see that uh, come through even more. We got them? Yep. All right, before we get to Jules Hennenberg, we'll tell you again that the PLL Weekly is brought to you by Mobile One Synthetic Oil. It keeps your engine running like new. Synthetic motor oils, trusted protection. It is the mobile advantage. And giving the Redwoods a big advantage after becoming the first player ever traded in the PLL, Jules Henningberg is the man, and he joins us here on PLL Weekly. Jules, you're with Gary Stein and Griffin Bass. How are you, my friend? I'm good. Do you, do you mind uh, just turning the volume up? I'm having trouble hearing you guys a little bit. All right, turn it up a little, Griffin, if you don't mind. Is that any better for you, Jules? You there? Jules, yep. 
Jules, can you yeah. can you hear me? I think you guys a little better now. Gotcha. Hey, so uh, tell me about this. I mean, a lot of stuff going on with you and going on with your team. But you know, one of the things that you'll always be in the record books for, if nothing else, is being the first player traded in PLL history. And we were there. I mean, it happened. You were in Baltimore actually when you played your first game for the Redwoods, and what a great game it was. But how did you feel about making that mark? You know, it, it's definitely uh, it's interesting because at the end of the day, you know, you never want to get traded not a good feeling no matter really how you cut it but i think uh you know there's a lot of good intentions behind the trade in general uh coming from both coaches so it worked out in my favor i think just uh being on a team where i could utilize my skill sets a little bit better you know uh carry the ball a little bit more i know over on the the wood snakes being matt he's an excellent player um am i not one of the best players if not the best player in the league right now and he so he's a great ball carrier and then we had reese as well and that's was playing great so it was just kind of it was tough over there on the, on the redwoods I think you could see it's just they, they needed a little bit more of a ball carrier behind the cage. So I kind of just popped in that role. And in that first game, I, I just had a, had a, had a good uh, flow going, and uh, I played well. So it was yeah. nice to kind of get that, uh, that monkey off the back in that first game for sure. I mean, is it fair to say that you celebrated that game? I mean, that was five goals and three assists. I mean, that is a career game right there. Yeah, I, I just treat it as, as any other game. Uh, I think you go into it just trying to play the uh, – the upper 90 percentile of your potential is kind of how I look at it. So, you know, whenever you can do that, uh, I think you can have one of those days. So I love to have a game like that every time I step on the field. Obviously, you can never play your best every time. But I think uh, with my skill set and what I bring to the table, I can, uh, I can definitely bring that kind of intensity and that level of play a lot of times when I step on the field. Hey, we're talking with Jules Hennenberg, attackman for the Redwoods of the PLL. He's tied for second in the league in points now with 26, tied for first in the league. He's actually number two in the league in points, tied for first with Connor Fields of the Chaos, 18 goals through the first seven games. Uh, let, let's get into a little bit about your backstory, Jules. Um, coming out of Maplewood, New Jersey, I mean, Maplewood, New Jersey itself sounds like a town out of Leave it to Beaver or something. What, what was your, what was your back, like, what was your growing up like in, in Maplewood? Uh, it, was, uh, it was great. I think uh, Maplewood, just, it's a diverse town. Um, I think that uh, there was a great lacrosse culture there when I was growing up. There was a lot of tradition in the program we had at the club. So I started playing when I was pretty young. And uh, I had a great experience playing through my, my rec program. And I fell in love with the game through that. And um, I played basketball growing up as well, um, all through uh, middle school, high school. I played at varsity level. Uh, so I think that, that was a big contribution to my level of competitiveness and how much I cared about sports in general. And then, you know, I think lacrosse has a stigma of just being, you know, one of those more upper echelon sports in terms of the, the type of players that attracts and stuff. And my back, background is a little more blue collar. Um, a little tougher, you know, from uh, just my side of town. And I think that also helped contribute to um, just my style of play and, and the type of level of intensity I play in, um, when I come on the field. So I think all that stuff, you know, looking back on it, um, just how I grew up and stuff, definitely there's a huge contribution. And I think it affected where I went to school as well. And I just kind of continued that blue collar that worked out there through Rutgers and then kind of into the pros now too. Great uh, video of you on YouTube about, your hometown and about it, it's actually called the walls I grew up on and you go back to your hometown Maplewood and kind of lead the camera to three or four of the different places that had walls that you basically just played wall ball on for probably years uh, just talk to me a little bit about that and how important it was for you to you know really just be by yourself at that time and just hone your skills yeah absolutely I think uh, when I was younger um, I had a wall across the street from me that was lit up, and uh, so I'd go out there at nighttime um, after I'd finished doing my chores, homework, dinner, and everything, just so I can kind of have that time to myself to know that I was putting the work in and kind of have that, that mental that mental side of it to know I was getting stuff done, just, especially times when there's snow on the ground or I was out of season. You know, it, was, it was great for me to go out there. And then as I got a little bit older, um, I had the wall next to me. I was built. There was a Walgreens built, big parking lot, big Walgreens built next to my house. And uh, they actually ended up having a light there. So that was lit up as well until about 12, 30, 1 o'clock at night. So I'd be out there pretty much every night and uh, just grinding. You know, it was, just, it was kind of one of those things that I felt that um, maybe if I wasn't playing great or if I thought that, you know, someone was better than me or whatever the case was, I, I would just go out there and, and put a lot of hours on that wall just to make sure I felt confident in myself and felt that I was, I was putting the work in just so I could be the best version of myself. And I also had the other wall that was over at uh, my local high school, which is Columbia High School. That was the wall we all played on the rec. We all practiced out on those fields, so I was on that wall all the time. I, I remember distinctly one of my coaches growing up, I think it was around like fifth or sixth grade, and he told me that 
you know, you got to get 50 in a row, lefty 50 in a row, righty. And that's kind of a barometer I had to set for myself. And once I kind of figured that out and got that lefty, got that ready, it kind of, I felt a little bit more confident about, you know, my skill sets in lacrosse. And then I started to kind of develop from there. And uh, those are just, just three of the walls, three of the places that, I, that kind of helped shape me. Like you said, having that alone time out there is just it's something that you can't really, uh, you can't really recreate. It's just it's an experience and it's it's a process, and I think it, it definitely contributed a lot to me the type of player I am today. We're talking with Jules Hendenberg, attackman for the Redwoods. So, am I to understand when you say that you basically taught yourself how to play both righty and lefty? Yeah, so I actually I broke my wrist when I was in eighth grade um, at my right wrist. So I was a, a purely righty player. I had a good left hand, but I wasn't as confident in it. Uh, as I as I could have been as I was today as I am today, and uh, after I broke it, I started to uh, I would just practice with my one hand lefty. Um, that was through basketball season. So when I play wall one stuff in basketball season, I was always playing left hand. And then I came back. I got my wrist, uh, my cast off my wrist, and that was uh, after six weeks. But my wrist still wasn't fully healed, so I put a soft cast on it. But I finished up my basketball season. I, I love basketball; it was my first love. And uh, so I took it very seriously. So in eighth grade, we were making a run to the championship. So I didn't play the whole season after I broke it, and then I made a run in the championship. Only I used a soft cast, and I used my left hand, so I played lefty. And um, that was kind of – was a, it was a great experience, and I, I think it helped develop my left hand. But at the same time, it ended up kind of hurting how my right hand operated. Um, it wasn't the same after that for a very long time, even through college. So um, I had to rehab, do a lot of stuff to fix it. I didn't play basketball my senior year to do rehab on my wrist for – uh, my senior year of lacrosse. So it was a whole big deal um, for me personally with a lot of mental uh, battles with that. And, uh, but in the long run, it actually helped me develop my left hand. And now I'm pretty fluid with my both left and right hand, which is a huge help now playing in the pros. How did you end up at Rutgers? Uh, Rutgers was uh, a couple of things, actually. I think the first thing was there's a couple guys in my town, uh, a guy named Brendan Porter, a pro player, 